Um, I mean, some of the records were so funny. Uh, you mentioned about the, in the um, Facebook post about the Bjork story. Oh, the Bjork story. Yeah, yeah so I'd love to, to hear more about that. So we did, um, Bjork did um, It's So So Quiet with my big band. Um, it's a great record. It, um, recording sessions, as you well know, are in slugs, you know, 10 to 1, 2 to 5, 6 to 9. So we had 10 to 1 at a big studio in London with a big band. She turned up. Well, she didn't turn up. She's looking for shoes. She's found her shoes. She's in the car. She's not in the car. She's in... It, it was 10 to 1. She came through the door. And if we recorded it in the 90s, so she'd been sort of probably mid-30s at the time, she skipped into the room. And I, I sort of didn't quite trust any woman in her late 30s who skipped to say hello. <laughs> so she got up to me eventually, and she said, um, what's going on? What, what, what are they doing? And, and um, I said, well, we lose the musicians at one o'clock. You know, they've all got other work, and they all have to be somewhere. And she said, I thought we had them all day. And I said, no, we, we, we 10 to 1 is the recording session, and it's 10 to 1. And she said, uh, oh, we'd better make this record then, hadn't we? <laughs> and she went into a booth. We couldn't do any more. And four minutes later, we had the record. You know, first take. And what she sang was what she sang. There were no overdubs. What the band played was what the band played. And you have that edge. And I always never forget this. There was the sort of final flourish on the brass. There was, we had two guys who basically were lead trumpeters on the session. And one of them said to the other, I'd better play those last two bars because you keep screwing it up. <laughs> so they swapped for the last two bars, the, the music parts. Mm. One read over one shoulder and up the other one. <laughs> and that was it. It, was, um, it really was. A, 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 but four minutes or four, four and a half minutes, we had the record. Yeah. Um, it, it was interesting, obviously. But, I mean, my working method because I literally, I, did, I didn't have a spotting session, I didn't have a, um, I was just literally given eight minutes to film or however much it was. And the timing notes from the music editor? Or no, no, no. I, I just had, I had the film, the, the music editor, everyone was taken by surprise, because they'd written, they basically, you know, not wash their hands of what was coming, but, but they, they'd said, right, the music's all locked, the film was locked, and suddenly I'm given a video of sound effects and, and the scene. And the first thing I notice, of course, is, is that, you know, you have certain parameters. One parameter is the Bond theme, and one parameter is, you know, also the, the, the stuff that's going on. It's absurd, then it's more absurd, then it's more absurd. So, you, you know, you, what you have to do is you you sort of look at it rationally and say, well, this is completely ludicrous. He's driven to a statue and the statue's on top of the tank and the tank, <laughs> he's wrecking St. Petersburg. And on the other hand, what you want to do with the music is say, right, I'm going to have a sort of semi-climax there and then another one here and another one here. And you, you sort of got your four moments where it has to be the, the, the Bond theme, where it has to be. And then I look for moments, for example, like, as you say, um, uh, when, when the cars are reversing and the tank is chasing them, I, I wrote one string section reversing and the other string section yeah. advancing. <laughs> so it was all deliberate, I have to say. You know. It really worked so well. And, and people, you know, even if they're not consciously noticing it, they're noticing it. So it's one, probably one of the reasons why the, the sequence sort of stood out at the time was because the rest of the film took no notice of that at all, you know, and basically just had long emotional moments, you know. And to, to work on this, I, I thought, well, this scene has to have all those sort of, you know, has to sort of mirror in, in a way what's going on, obviously. I was thinking about this earlier, about your parody music and comedy music. So a lot of composers uh, complain or, or have a problem with writing for comedy. 
What do you uh, What do you say about that? Do you like writing? Is I love writing for comedy. Yeah. I love writing for comedy, um, and I, I also love writing things that are inherently comic without. What, you know, what makes something inherently comic? I, I wish I knew. I mean, there's <laughs> something um, something about what you write that, that, or a combination of instruments that just makes it funny. So is it something that tickles your ear a certain way, or is it yes, a culturally? I think so. Uh, a lot derived... of it. Um, I'm, I'm, it. Also, it depends. You know, if the comedy is sort of slapstick, or if it's some sort of verbal comedy, or interplay, or. Or, or or totally visual, you know, and it, it, you, you're conditioned. But you, I guess you subconsciously think about how you do it, but without overanalyzing in some ways. I have to tell this story. I mean, it, it's a wonderful story. You know, in your dreams, you meet your heroes, and it goes a certain way. My, my dream, Julie Stein was one of my heroes. He wrote um, Gypsy and... Funny Girl and Diamonds of Girls, Best Friend, etc., etc., etc. Great songwriter. And I saw that he was coming to do a show with Don. Um, I thought, oh, I'd, you know, I'd really like to meet Julie Stein. So I rang Don up on the Friday night, and we never got round to it. We talked about all sorts of things, and we never got round to... And then he said, oh, I've got Julie Stein coming in to do a show. And I went, that's it, that's my opportunity, you know. And I missed it. I missed it completely, you know, and, and I didn't get a chance to say anything. Following night, the phone rang. What are you doing tomorrow? Um, not much. Oh, I've written this song with Julie Stein, and I think you'd be perfect to arrange it. So I turn up at nine o'clock at Arthur Schwartz's house in Walton Street, and there is Martin Sharnin, who wrote Annie. There is Erwin Costell, who's one of my heroes. Julie Stein and Don Black. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm 24 years old. What am I doing here? You know, I'm hick from the sticks. I, I know nothing, you know. What, what, what can I do that none of them can do? And my dream always was that if I met Julie Stein, I would say one of the earliest songs I knew ever was a song of yours, a song called I Don't Want Anybody At All. And he'd say... Yeah, that's right. You know that song. I can't believe it. You know, and he'd play it or sing it, and we'd be, we'd be buddies. And that was, you know, <laughs> madness or what. So I go to Arthur Schwartz's house. Julie Stein is there, and I say, you know, I know. I one of the first songs I knew was one of yours. Uh, I don't want anybody at all. He said, you know that song. I said, yes. He said. He turned to Martin Sharnin and Owen Costell and said, I wrote that song for Roy Rogers and Trigger. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know any... I've never met anybody who knows it and blah, 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 blah. And he goes to the piano and he starts playing it. Yeah. Gets to the middle of the song and says, I can't remember the middle eight. I ran to the piano, sat down next to him, played the middle eight for him and we wound up singing... The last eight next to each other. <laughs> he then hugged me and said, I'm going to enjoy working with you. <laughs> that doesn't happen. When does that happen? When does that happen? <laughs>